Hello. Uh, Steve Ward. I'm co-chair of the New York section of the AES. I want to welcome you to our live feed and uh, guests in attendance in the Bove Room at Mercy University. We're thrilled to uh, have our panelists, but I would like to introduce to you uh, David Bialik, who will be our moderator. David. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want to welcome everybody, especially on the live feed um, and also here in person. Uh, this event started as a discussion I was having with Steve Schultes over at WNYC. I said, ah, I see that WNYC is going to be hosting, uh, wait, wait, don't tell me, could we get the, the crew in to talk about the production of the show? And Steve goes, hey, that's a great idea. He goes, when do you want to do that? And I said, well, how about the week of the show? He goes, oh, I'm busy. Um, and, and then we tried having the uh, presentation at WNYC, but unfortunately they didn't have a space. And luckily, Mercy University, uh, which Steve Ward works for, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he was able to arrange this nice space that we can have this. And considering that these people were flying in from Chicago, we had to make it a, a place that was easy to get to. So it was just down the street for you. So I hope you appreciate that. And I want to introduce, we have Lorna White, who is the technical director of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and Robert Newhouse, who is the executive producer, you said? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Production manager, we Production call it. Production manager. <laughs> and um, we... We're going to have a nice discussion about the production of one of the most popular uh, nationwide shows that NPR does th for entertainment and news purposes, because I, th I think you can't just say it's an entertaining show. It's also a news show as well. Correct. And it is the NPR News Quiz, and I've been listening to it for many, many years. And uh, to me, uh, my Saturdays aren't complete without sitting, having lunch, and listening to the show. And there has to be so much involved in putting together a, sh a show where, number one, you have a, a contest uh, contestants that are connecting in. You have an you're doing this in front of a live audience, and a lot of times on location, and you're also dealing with comedians that are not scripted, I don't think. No. No. And the show is just fabulous. So I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to Lorna, who can talk a little about the show. And then, then we got some questions and so forth. And you will be able to ask questions as well. So Lorna White. Thank you, David. Um, I think to, to understand, especially where Wait, Wait is today, it would be nice to understand the history of the show and how it developed. Um, and why we do production the way we do it, because it's, it's kind of old school, but it works for us. Um, back in 1998, um, I had moved to Chicago and was working with Robert at the NPR Chicago Bureau, and NPR said, we're going to start this new show um, in six weeks, and you're going to record it over at the local public radio station, which is WBEZ, and edit it and put it out for broadcast. So we had to come up with how this was going to work. And the basic format of the show was going to be the host in Chicago with us, um, listeners calling in on the telephone to play the games. And they're prearranged callers. They're not just calling in randomly. We've actually screened them ahead of time. Um, a few sound effects. And then we had our beloved judge and scorekeeper, Carl Castle, at NPR in DC, BISDN. And then we had three other panelists. And they could have been at the New York Bureau, at the LA Bureau. They could have been at a member station. And in the beginning, they started off as writers, as uh, columnists for the Washington Post, as humorists. They weren't you know, the full-fledged comedians that we're used to having these days. So what we did um, was that we would go over to BEZ, and this is Robert sitting at the big um, Wheatstone console that they had installed for us, um, and Peter's through the glass, and that's Mike Danforth in the background, who's our executive producer. And we had to just 
sort of kludge together the equipment that we had because there was no budget for this and it's public radio. So we had a couple of these 360 shortcuts hanging around which were great for firing off sound effects or playing tape clips and you could even edit on them. If you needed to edit a tape clip, it wasn't for the entire show. <laughs> but um, that worked well for us. And then we went back to the NPR Chicago Bureau and edited the entire show on a Sonic Solutions um, DAW. And that was done sort of as triage. It was either Robert or myself at the, at the keyboard with the producer sitting next to us saying in, out, in, out. And we started at the beginning of what we recorded and we hoped it came out the time at the end. And if it didn't, then we went back in uh, and we fixed things and moved things around and added music. So that product production model, we would start at, would you say, 11.10 on a Friday Well, that's morning. when we start recording. We, of course, would get there a little early, but yeah. we had to wait for Carl Castle to be finished with his last newscast of the day, which was noon Eastern time. So by about noon 10, he would make it uh, to the studio and we could start recording. Yeah, so we would be up and running and have continuity checks, start the show, go till about one o'clock at the local station, uh, tear everything down that we needed to clean up and then go back to the bureau and start editing. And it would go until who knows when because it was uh, probably 54, 55 minutes worth of audio. And we had to put a news break hole in the top of that, didn't we? Yes, we did, yeah. To get it to DC so it could be uplinked by NPR, we had to feed it in real time on a T1. So we had to bake in, you know, it was, it was the one minute billboard, there was the five minute newscast hole, then there was the rest of the show. So it was all done in real time and we would have them send us back the confidence heads off their that recorder so that we could hear what was being recorded. And if there was, if, if the T1 dropped, if there was a glitch, you know, if there was bad edit, we had to stop, fix it, do the whole thing all over again. So sometimes you got out of there at 10.30, sometimes you got out of there at midnight, you know, or later, just depending on uh, what had happened that particular night. So we did that type of production for two years. Did you run out of satellite time at any point? This was, no, this was on the, this was on the T1, this was the full-time circuit between us and oh, NPR, okay. yeah. so there was no booking of satellite time. That okay. was something that happened Saturday morning. And, and when the tape was finally, when the audio was finally delivered to NPR, then the master control engineer had to walk it across the hall to, okay. to the MOTSI to get it to the uplink. And this might be getting ahead of what uh, Lauren is talking about, but uh, at that time, um, if a station wanted to air the show, they had to either have their transmitter open when it was being uh, uh, uplinked uh, or they had to record it for later broadcast. Now they can just take it off of the server. We have a server called Content Depot that they just you know can pick pick the uh, show off of. But back then, they had to be there and ready to take it when uh, when NPR was feeding it. Right, right. That was one of my first jobs <laughs> doing downloads for NPR. Yeah. So after after we messed around with this for um, three months, we decided we needed a new host. We had started with Dan Coffey. And Peter Sagal became the host um, within a couple of months. He was the original panelist on the show. But uh, he took over, and we got a little popular with the member stations. We would go do these dog and pony shows at uh, like public radio conventions and things like that, and stations would pick us up. And one station in um, Park City, Utah, was very adamant that we needed to come out and try to do it live. And we finally gave in. So in 1980, 19 no, 2000. into 2000, yeah. we went to uh, Salt Lake City to a little liberal arts college to do a live show. And it was tough. <laughs> I, tough. I wasn't there because somebody had to be back in Chicago to uh, uh, to record uh, what Lorna was feeding via ISDN. We yeah, we decided that the best production model was to have temporary ISDN lines installed, and there were two, so that we could use uh, one leading up to the show to get us behind the NPR firewall, 
for internet because when you checked into the hotel, there was not internet at the time. We had to, we had to create our own um, internet for the people to do the work, for the writers to do the work. So they usually work somewhere on site with us in a room not far from the stage. So we'd run one ISDN line there and then the other one to the, to the stage. And at the last minute, we'd flip that second line to the stage so that we had a backup. And one of us would mix the show, feed it to the other one who was sitting in Chicago with a producer. They would take notes. And after the show was done, the one person would strike at the location and get ready to come back while these guys were editing the next day. Um, we decided that we needed uh, production elements, so we had Carl walk around with these signs that said, Hi, I'm Carl Castle, NPR Big Wigs are listening. And we would actually uh, elicit these laughs and, and applauses so that we could use them to cover edits later in the show. Now, you must understand something. Carl Castle was the ultimate newsman and newscaster. Uh, we were just talking before this how he would always adjust his tie before he was speaking on, uh, on the air. And I just can't imagine him walking around with that sign. <laughs> oh, he loved it. He was a ham. Um, he loved nothing more than to, than to do this show. Um, and in fact, when we, we decided that we needed to have a prize for the show, we wanted a Carl Castle action figure. And NPR News thought it was beneath Carl to do that. So this is why we came up with the voicemail idea. Um, and he loved doing those. Um, the picture below is the first uh, group of panelists and myself. We have Roxanne Roberts. Um, we have Roy Blunt Jr., myself, Charlie Pierce, Peter Sagal, and one of the producers, Diantha Parker. And my NPR's Michael Cullen uh, was with me on that show as well. This is the basic um, setup of the stage. Um, it started as a simple setup. What would, a, what would most venues have? You know, what, what did we need to bring? What, did we, what could we count on them, count on for them to provide? So we provide this, some of the soft goods. We provide uh, the signage on the front. We provide the banner that hangs in the back. Um, everything else comes from the venue. Um, and as we were discussing what kind of radio show performance this would be, um, we decided against playing just to the people in the audience because that feels a little ex you know, exclusive to the people who are listening at home. And we didn't just want to play to the people at home either. Um, so we came up with this happy medium where the listeners call in um, from around the country but the audience gets the benefit of seeing everything happen, seeing the mistakes, seeing the things we can't air because of the FCC, and it's, it's worked out pretty well. Stay tuned, and we're gonna just get back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is the reason why uh, you, you can see in Lorna's illustration that the production tables are on stage, and uh, rather than hiding all the production uh, uh, backstage or in a booth someplace, uh, uh, we found it beneficial to let the audience see everything. And when we needed to stop to bring a guest on, we would stop, and uh, that was part of the show for them. That and doesn't uh, make you too nervous th when you're working? No, no, no. And part of the reason <laughs> that the production table is so close and on stage was because we didn't have the budget for a snake. <laughs> <laughs> All so right, the truth comes out. The truth comes out. So yeah, it's, you know, people wear headphones on stage. We don't use stage monitors blaring back at um, the talent. Um, the producers backstage all wear, or upstage, all wear headphones, um, which creates its own problems, but we can talk about that later or not. Um, well before you continue, how many people is in the crew uh, when you go to do a show? The, the, you mean the producers? Uh, yes. It kind of uh, varies depending on, um, on how many people want to go to the, uh, the city. We'll have a lot of people in New York. Uh, <laughs> not so many in Omaha. But what, about in, what about in your home theater in Chicago? Um, 
that's a slightly different setup. We actually have a booth and the producers yeah. aren't on stage. But generally, it's safe to say there's approximately a dozen people on staff yeah. at any... Some are backstage. And, uh, but and, uh, and there has to be a hierarchy of the producers uh, of how the, com uh, how, how the direction is taken. And so right. Forth. Michael Danforth is our executive producer. Um, used to be Doug Berman. We promoted him up to Benevolent Overlord. Um, so mm -hmm. he's not with us all week. Um, he just kind of checks in on Thursday to see how the script is. And I believe he will be here. He's here this week is as he well. Um, but there's Mike Danforth, um, who's our boss. Um, Ian Chillog is another producer. Um, Jennifer Mills, Miles Dornboss, Lillian King. I'm um, going to stop you because I don't want you to forget someone and then have it go back to you. Right. <laughs> so there's, there's a bunch of writers. There's a bunch of writers, but Mike's our boss. And, and Mike has uh, had experience on A Perennial Companion. He did some work there for a couple of years before coming to NPR. Uh, let's see. So when we come to a venue, um, which in the early days was little tiny regional theaters or a church, in Baltimore or a synagogue in Boston, whatever uh, the public radio station could find for us, because we used them as fundraising um, shows for the station. We came and did it for them. So they would put us in whatever venue that they could find or get um, on a trade. So it wasn't always ideal. Um, but we would figure out, you know, how the show would work. So the first thing you come in, you load in, you hang the banner, you find the tables, you wait for the tablecloths because the tablecloths are never there and you can't put anything on the table until there's a tablecloth. Um, so a lot of the same little issues over and over and over and over for years until you finally figure out how to get it right. Um, lighting, lighting's always a trick. Sometimes it's easy to do the lighting. Sometimes they have to run a genie so you can't run your tables until they push the genie back and forth across the stage a couple of times. Um, sometimes they can lower it and, f and focus that way. We've had, we've had venues that, that can do things very quickly. We've had venues that do things very slowly. It just is a crapshoot at times. And um, we really, uh, we're a radio show, so the lighting is not terribly important <laughs> to us. We <laughs> like the audience to be able to see, but uh, a lot of times they will say, well, uh, send us your light plot, and we're like, I'm an engineer, audio engineer. I don't know from light plots. And I how many people in the background in in your uh, production have stage experience, or is it all, all radio? Uh, I'm strictly radio. He's, yeah, he's I out. I was a sound designer uh, in theater for a number of years before I got captured by NPR, and mm -hmm. I'm still trying to find my way out. But and Peter had done some acting. And uh, and was a playwright, so he he knew his way around. So the there era. are a few people that know what stage left and stage right are, and so forth. Well, we've taught all of them that. Today. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but n most people have a uh, radio experience, uh, writing experience, and not a lot of uh, uh, on stage experience. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that we set up for the shows is. Um, Everybody's got headphones. Everybody's got their own headphone app so that the director has the ability to talk to each person individually so they can direct them or, or try to head off problems before they happen. Um, we use uh, mute switches on the microphones, um, which don't affect the mics when they're muted. Um, they're pretty, pa they're passive, so we don't get any pops or anything like that. So at least if somebody coughs, they can, they can kill their mic. The next mic's going to pick it up. Um, so it's not going to eliminate it, but at least it's not full force. Um, we use DPA microphones um, these days, um, which I like quite a bit. We started with the, um, the style that had the hardwired both ears, and the talent hated them after two hours of, of wearing them. Went to the went to the Deepine series, um, and use a combination of either the single ear or now they have the double ear, the softer rubber ones, which are which are really nice and help keep the mics um, in place better. Plus the headphones, the Sony headphones on top of those, um, really kind of lock those in 
most times. Sometimes we've gone to venues where we can't get to the stage until afternoon. We usually like to hit the stage at 10 a.m. just to try to get everything plugged in before lunch at one. Um, sometimes we've done festivals where that's not possible. We can't get the stage till two o'clock. So we'll set up backstage and then they'll carry the tables out for us and we can do some fast plugging in and uh, hope it all works that way. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what we kind of grew into. Um, people loved Carl. Um, he loved doing the show. He was very happy. Um, Peter grew into his own as, uh, as host quite well. He's, he's excellent at what he does. Um, do you have any questions about Peter or Carl? I don't know. Um, uh, no, but um, what, what I'm kind of wondering is um, you, your, uh, your panel of, uh, your panelists, um, are they on the stage too, or are you doing some of them remotely now? No, they're all on stage with us. Okay. They are all on stage. And when did you uh, move away from ISDM? Uh, when did... Oh. When did, when? You, when did uh, Content Devo open? Oh, yeah. nice segue. When, <laughs> <laughs> when we got laptops. Um, so the ISDN was, ISDNs were, were necessary to get the audio to the Bureau so that we could edit them, edit on that Sonic Solutions DAW. We finally were able to get to the laptop stage probably in 2006, seven, somewhere around in there. Are we so, probably around there. We yeah. were still in yeah. the old bureau. Yeah, yeah. And it was then decided that the editing would go to the producers of the show. So Rob and I wouldn't edit quite so much anymore. So if you think of the show as basically being three segments, one producer would take the first segment, another producer would take the second segment, which would be the bluff and the not my job game. He edited that for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, another producer would take the third segment, which was limericks and fill in the blank. Um, so you had three people working at the same time, which shortened the production schedule quite a bit. Um, and then Rob and I would get all the elements at the end, we'd QC them, we'd master it, it would go out to the world. And all the elements are timed specifically that you know you have a certain amount of time for each one? Right, right. So don't, a don't ask us what the clock looks like for the show because we know that the first segment is 12 minutes and okay. the second is 18.30 and the third is 19 minutes. But we don't know what the whole clock looks like. But do you produce those elements at different times uh, during a live show or are they always in the same order? They're usually all in the same order unless, unless not my job yeah. guest is early or late. Right. So if the special guest calls in early, we will sometimes the producer who, who uh, uh, is the contact for the callers will call up the bluff caller, which is the game that comes right before not my job, and say, hey, our guest is a little early. Can you hold on? And, or, or, you know, can we call you back in a little bit? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the guest isn't ready, so we have to move on to something else. And when you're re uh, dealing with the people calling in, are you insisting on them being on a landline or are you taking them on a cell phone? Uh, nowadays, there's such varying qualities. Yeah, we used to insist on a landline, uh, but now landlines aren't that great either. No. Uh, so we had to capitulate to cell phones and also because a lot of people just don't have landlines anymore. But lately, we, uh, this is something that uh, we, we'll probably get to later, is when we started doing shows via Zoom during the pandemic when we couldn't do live performance, um, we discovered that we can connect to uh, a, a, a telephone lines via Zoom. There's a, a telephone call out function on Zoom that you can pay for. Uh, and also that a lot more people knew how to use Zoom, even if it was on their laptop. So uh, we just connect to them via internet now and don't have to count on, the, on Ma Bell for that. And do you find uh, that you have uh, l less feedback problems and uh, less mix minus issues and so forth? The mix minus is, is, is the same either way. You just have to, you have to route it correctly. It's a, it's a different set of problems. 
uh, as far as the quality. You, you, with the telephone, there's a lot of noise on the lines, uh, uh, but it's always, almost always going to be there. With the internet, sometimes it drops out. And uh, we'll probably, you know, we'll get into the Zoom shows we did during the pandemic later, but once we had Ron Howard and his brother Clint, yeah. and what we would do then is we would, we would, they were on separate lines, and we synced them together, but at some point, Clint's line dropped out and went out of sync. So by the end of the recording, they were about three seconds off. So we had to go back in and pull that track closer. So it, you know, we would have to, w whenever we had a situation like we would have to like needle drop every few uh, minutes to make sure that everything was still in sync because the internet would just like kind of quash it together. Uh, do, that brings up the question, do you have buffering issues? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who doesn't? <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, continue learning. Continue. So we shortened the production time, which was great. Now, how could we shorten the load in and, and load out times? So we went through um, a variety of uh, different types of road cases, um, which never seem to last very long when the forklift goes through them. Um, <laughs> We don't have our own truck or anything. We don't we, have we, our we own truck. We don't have a driver, yeah. so they go out the f by freight, yeah. and the freight company holds them for us so that we're not doing a complete round trip every show. So they'll go from, like this one went from Portland, Maine, to New York City, and, then, and so we just ship it on to the next place. And we go out about once a month, once every four or five weeks, so it, it'll be sitting in somebody's dock someplace. Um, and sometimes they come with holes in them. Do you, do you uh, maintain like redundant racks or something uh, if you're shipping out a, a full wired rack or something like that? No. No. We do them no. dangerously. Because <laughs> so there's only so much we can we can. Yeah, there's carry only so around. much we can do and so much we can afford. Yeah. Um, we, we, I mean, we have a little bit of redundant equipment. Like there's extra phone uh, phoner units, phoner hybrids, mm -hmm. uh, and but uh, you know we only have one console that we travel with, for instance. Um. So yeah, the the chest of drawers type road cases are great um, for organizing and loading out quick. The, the slots to just drop in your gear um, instead of wrapping them in bubble wrap or blankets or whatever. I mean, just, just picking it up and dropping it in. Just shaved probably an hour, you yeah. know, off, off the load ends. Yeah, all this equipment that you see in the, in the, in the rack uh, that, that's on, I think, your right. Uh, it would be great to put everything in a single rack, but each of those units goes in a different place on the table. There is one small effects rack that sits next to the, uh, the console that has everything that the recording engineer uses. But for instance, we have the, uh, the IFB unit in there that sits in front of the director. We have a headphone amp that has to go somewhere else on the table so that all the producers sitting at the table. So we have, you know, it would be wonderful to have everything in a single rack, but it, it all has to go to different places. I always assumed you had like packed up complete tables and so forth. Yeah, in, wouldn't that be nice? In my <laughs> dreams, <laughs> in my <laughs> dreams. But you know, yeah. if we had if we had our own guy moving them, yeah. or yeah. our own gal moving them, yeah. you know, that would be one thing. But to but to put all this stuff out at the hands of a freight company all the time, it just didn't make and sense. And you travel with your own engineering support to fix whatever breaks. Nope. Up. No, that's us. That's <laughs> us. <laughs> We bring it in uh, about, you know, Lorna just said that we, we sort of leapfrog from date to day to date. We don't uh, travel that much between, say, early December and uh, the beginning of February because winter. And, uh, you know, we've been burned too many times. So we usually, that's around the time we usually bring it all back to Chicago and we can do repairs and, or, you know, resupply the cases and that sort of thing. Robert, would you tell the great blizzard story oh 2011 the groundhog day blizzard uh the third largest blizzard in chicago history um we were scheduled to play miami that week everybody was looking forward to going to miami um all weekend long before we uh, were going to be traveling down there the the weatherman was telling us there's going to be a storm it's going to start on Tuesday at about 1 o'clock. It's going to last about 24 hours. 
and drop 25 inches of snow. All weekend long, they're talking about this. So I got into uh, the office on Monday, fortunately, because of a daughter that had to be dropped off at daycare a little early. I was getting in early on Mondays that, that day. So I thought, maybe I'll just see if I can, you know, we were gonna be leaving on, on Wednesday. I said, maybe I'll just see if I can, uh, I can change my flight to Tuesday. And I was able to do it. By the time everybody got into the office, there were no flights out of Chicago available anymore. Nobody could change their flights. We did manage to find a flight for, uh, for Peter Sagal, but as it turned out, Peter and I were the only people going to, uh, who made it to Miami. We brought in a second engineer from Los Angeles. Carl was coming in from uh, Washington anyway. We had uh, a, a producer to sort of act as operations manager, fly in from Washington as well. And as it turns out, for once in their entire career, the weatherman was absolutely correct. It started snowing at about noon on Tuesday. It snowed for 24 hours and dropped 25 inches. And uh, our offices were closed for a couple of days, so all the producers were working from home. They were still able to write the show from home and you know, trade their ideas via uh, you know, email. Uh, but Peter and I were the only ones from Chicago that made it there. But uh, electricity and connectivity uh, survived? Uh, well, in Miami, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we actually did two shows that time, like we're doing at Carnegie Hall this week. Uh, we usually just do the Thursday night show, uh, but that we were doing a Thursday and Friday night show. And I remember on Friday morning, I was uh, editing the previous night's show because that's the one that had to go on the air. Uh, and I was emailing back and forth with one of the producers. By Friday, everybody was back in the office. They had cleared enough snow, but there were still no flights going in or out of Chicago. Uh, so I was emailing with a producer and I saying, you know, I say, hey, I need to wait a minute. I'm editing out on the balcony of my hotel room and the sun is too strong for me, so I have to go inside. And so he said, that's okay. I need a minute to dump my garbage can on your desk. <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I am a little wistful that I missed the third largest uh, blizzard in Chicago history. That would have been fun. That's but, the one uh, that closed Lakeshore Drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah, it, uh, yeah, it was a disaster area for us. So, so that's why we don't travel much in the wintertime. <laughs> well, when it's sunny, we go to places like Red Rocks. So as the years have gone by, we've gotten into bigger venues. Yeah. So here's Robert at Red Rocks. Yeah. And this is uh, Millennium Park. And what, what is the uh, uh, approximate audience count there? At Red Rocks or at, at Millennium Park? Both. Red Rocks was about seven or 8,000. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful amphitheater built into the... And let me just amphitheater. interject, everybody. That's seven or 8,000 to watch a radio a show. A radio yeah. show. <laughs> radio is still alive. Yeah. And Millennium Park, we've done four or five shows there, and we've had attendance up as high as like 17,000 plus. Yeah. Um, when we had Chance the Rapper there, that we broke the attendance record for that park, um, which was crazy. Yeah, and then uh, uh, after Chance's segment was over, it was a lot fewer than that. <laughs> but still. But, yeah. but then but again, still. you were saying about the Dalai Lama? Yeah, we, apparently the crew told us we outdrew the Dalai Lama. So, so that's, yeah. good. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. Uh, this, I believe, is the Man Center. That's the Man Center in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, so you can see that the panelists um, sit at the table, and that's Robert's head. <laughs> and uh, I understand that the, the panels are there, and they have headsets and microphones and everything. But it's amazing when you're broadcasting the show that we don't hear any echo or, s or slapback um, uh, from the audience or, or in the uh, audience speakers at all. And that, that says a lot to, that's to your crew. Well, that's great. And, and, and in partnership with the, the house staff as well. And it is a very, very fine line. The instruction that we give them is that this is, it's not rock and roll. And we try to ask them to keep it as soft as possible. I have an announcement. We're having a test. Uh, we, we know about tests and broadcasts. 
Okay, I think, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, great. I assume we can edit this out. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Right. Um, no, but we've had uh, tornado warnings. Mm -hmm. We've had at this particular venue um, a torrential rainstorm where the water just came cascading down yeah, towards like, the stage. Yeah. Um, there's, there's Did anything short out? No. No. Yeah, no. we were like, we're yeah, all, no, yeah. We were all raised. So, um, yeah, so, so. We tell the, the house staff that uh, we, we ask them to keep the levels as soft as possible while still making it comfortable for the audience to hear. And it is a very fine line because the more we get from the house, as David mentions, that uh, you know you're going to you're going to hear the echo, the slapback. It's more difficult for the millions of people listening on the radio and podcasting. And to do you understand. walk that crowd and l l listening just to make sure that everything's audible? I I have walked the crowd. Um, it's tricky. So, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Um, our, our primary focus is to get a radio show out of it. If people who come to watch us do a radio show, you know, there's thousands of people, they're laughing, they're talking, they're playing the games. I, you know, I've heard them talking to each other quite well while I've walked through some of these venues, they're making their own noise. And we simply cannot overcome that. Um, our talent does not project. It's, you know, it's, it's talk radio kind of thing. Um, they're not singers. They're not playing amplified instruments. We can't overcome an audience that's putting out, you know, 100 and 115, 117 DBL. Um, or, SPL. So it's it's tricky for us, but we have to focus on getting the broadcast. So we will err on the side of caution. Why don't we just let this go before, <laughs> since the... For those at home, we're having a fire alarm test. Absolutely. Our original uh, full-time performance venue in Chicago was in the basement of a bank building, a Chase Bank Auditorium, which when he moved in there was the Bank One Auditorium. Uh, and it was right next to the subway. So <laughs> we, we had, to, had to have some uh, subway sound effects in our little arsenal so that if we had to do an edit when the subway was going by and it suddenly disappeared, <laughs> we'd have to fill it in. Yeah. But yeah, so you would definitely hear the subway going by. Um, here we see in the foreground uh, Miles Dornboss, and he is the producer that takes care of um, getting the listeners on the phones. In this particular instance, we were still using main lines um, and the Telos um, hybrid phoner units. Um, Mike Danforth is beyond him, Ian Chilog, and Robert. Um, but they sit all pretty close so they can take notes and. Um, yeah, it's also a Millennium Park in Chicago. Yeah. And this is this is what they look like at the front. So you can see in the in the right, that's Robert's um, one rack. small effects rack. Um, at that time, that looks like the Mackie console that we had. We we started off with Mackie SR24 consoles um, because we needed four aux buses, and we went to the Midas Venice consoles. Um, they don't travel quite as well. We're finding, and they're 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 nearing the end of their life, so yeah. we have to come up with something new. So if anybody's got any suggestions <laughs> for an mm -hmm. analog console with four aux buses, yeah, we uh, uh, one of the reasons we chose the Mackies, we also used uh, outboard uh, mic preamps because we didn't really trust the Mackie preamps. So we had benchmark preamps that we would use, uh, and one of the reasons we chose the Mackie is that uh, if it went south any guitar center would have one, <laughs> and so we'd be able to go. But now, there are no guitar centers, so <laughs> or at least not that many of them anymore. So uh, it's, it's harder to find stuff on the fly like that because you get everything on the internet. But uh, that's why we went, ended up going with the Midas, which has much better preamps. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, and as you can see, we all like to dress up for our <laughs> shows. <laughs> that, that's another thing I was going to ask you is how much stage uh, rules or 
on the live shows? The, I mean, uh, do they ever want you guys in costumes? Do they ever want you guys uh, uh, draping that the, you don't see the wires and things? We try. I'm going to go back. Yeah, um, we, we tried and failed on that one, as yeah, you can we see. Yeah, we failed. This, this, looks to, this looks to be like one of those, you know, tablecloth slash skirts that are on all in one. Wow. Usually we would like the two pieces so that we can hide the wires. But all in all, you know, people come to see, you know, come see our radio show, come see all of this. So it it doesn't bother us anymore. Um, we used to try to. There's an old one. Seth is there. Anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, used to, we used to dress up and stuff like that. We don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Paula does. Paula's got the most great, fabulous suits oh, that's to wear. Paula Poundstone's back. Uh, on yeah. The, um, and and she sounds like she's always wearing. Uh, yeah, her, she's she's she a very, sounds she's a flashy dresser. Um, that's Mo Rocca and uh, Roxanne, Roxanne Roberts, Roberts with Peter and Carl in the background. Um, so we've when we set everybody up, we we create sort of an arc with this with the furniture so that they can see each other. Um, because it's really important that not only do they see each other and play off each other, they want to play off the audience as well. So they want, when we, when we have the house lights, they're usually half or something so they can see the faces. Um, in about 2004, um, we started playing with the idea of doing live shows every week. Up until then, we were only doing these road shows 10 to 12 a year and the rest of them were back in the studio and there was a vast difference um, in how uh, good those shows were. So we were able to move into the Chase Bank Auditorium which is a bank auditorium. Um, it was uh, about 406 seats or something. Uh, um, no, less than that. Uh, after the renovation these are the larger wider seats. It was only uh, seated 485. Okay. Um, Peter Sago likes to call this, it, it looks like a place where your company would call you for a compulsory, compulsory HR meeting. Okay. <laughs> we, we called it the comedy bunker because it's underground. Yeah. Um, there, was, uh, there was one time early in our, in our career there at the Chase Bank where Carl couldn't make his flight because of weather. And we did have an ISDN line uh, that Chase let us use. So we rigged up a little bowling shirt that's got his name on it. And we sold, for some reason, we sold these pillows that had his face on them. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was our little judge and scorekeeper, and that stayed throughout the entire show because Carl wasn't there to stand behind the lectern. And the listener was none the wiser because he was in a studio in, in Washington on ISDN. So. Um, we have a large fan base, and we were lucky enough to get Tom Hanks to agree to come in and fill in for Peter Sagal, um, yes, was which was an absolute delight. He came in on Tuesday. He wrote with the staff. He worked with us. He recorded our promos. He, he worked eight hours a day. He bought us coffee. <laughs> um, he worked with us Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and Thursday to do the show, and it was an absolute surreal experience and very fun. She's just saying that because he made up a song about Lorna. He did. <laughs> um, in whenever this was, this was our... We're not going to hear the song? Not on this computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had our, was it our 20th? It was our 20th, so that was in 2018. In 2018, we had our 20th uh, anniversary, and we decided to go big. So we went to the Chicago Theater. And we brought in every panelist that we could find that was free. And by this time, we had grown from, you know, probably a dozen uh, panelists that we rotated in and out to we probably had 40 easily. Yeah. Um, so this became a big production, and we would, we would bring in three for a game, um, then take them off and bring in another three for the next game. Um, and then at the end of the show, uh, for Bluff the Listener, we divided them into teams, and then each one of them got one, not Bluff the Listener, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, yeah. Lightning, yeah. fill in the fill blank. Lightning, fill in the blank. Each one of them got a question for lightning, fill in the blank. So we had to bring in a production truck, uh, Timothy Powell's production truck, and I directed from backstage. 
and we recorded it and we yeah. and we aired it and it was it was amazing to see all the faces yeah. in one place. And someone asked about uh, doing things in front of the audience. And this is a great example of that. that they just loved it. You know, so take out one group of panelists, truck in the other one. You know? um, are you ever using a, a prompting system or a, a, any? Uh, no. no, everything no. is ad lib. Okay. Yeah. Well, the 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 bluffs yeah. that they read for the bluff listener game, they're they're usually typed out. Or they're reading them off their phone. Yeah, they, they write those ahead of time. They, they get the topic the day before, and they write their bluff stories. Uh, I was wondering, because some of those cannot be right, right off the top of the head. No, no, no but, but everything else they say, you know, every every uh, comment they make, and they, and they don't know the answers to the questions that the, the listeners are being asked either. And sometimes they direct them with incorrect hints <laughs> to the wrong um, answer. As a producer, I'm sure you've thought of every once in a while throwing sound effects in one of those. Have you ever thought of, done that? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I usually just throw in sound effects uh, when I know it's not going to wind up on the air. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, if if things go really go run off the rails, uh, I, and I, I'll use them uh, generously during uh, the. Uh, Q and A after the show. P uh, Peter often does a, a Q and A after the show, and I'll I'll throw stuff in. I'm ready with them though. <laughs> um, it's making me want to go to a show. <laughs> <laughs> in March of 2020, we headed to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, to play another show at the lovely Fox Theater. And uh, I remember getting off the elevator uh, that Thursday morning and seeing Mike Danforth, our executive producer. And he says, I'm on my way to a meeting. We don't know if we're going to do a show tonight. Don't tell anybody. And um, this is when COVID like became real, the day it became real. Um, so we went to the theater. We didn't say anything. We proceeded to set up um, as if everything was normal and went to lunch at 1 o'clock and came back at 2. And by that time, the decision was made that the theater would not admit the audience. But we still had to do a show. It was, it was difficult because we knew about two hours before the crew knew. And we, we needed to let Fox management tell the crew. So it was, we, we had to work as if everything was just fine. And you know everybody knew that coronavirus was out there. Uh, and uh, they had a, I think, after we left the following week, they were going to be starting a, a month-long run of Hamilton was coming in, and these guys were all going to get jobs doing that. Uh, but you know what happened. Yeah. Bad yeah. Yeah. So there were about eight people in the audience that night when we did that show. Um, but we, we recorded a show and got it out, and we all were able to fly home. So that was the important part. Yeah. Um, so then we entered the COVID years. Um, yeah, Lorna's cat got paid as a production assistant. Um, <laughs> they were they spent a lot of time on that laptop. Um, so this is where you know the, the the early years of doing the in studio shows came in handy. We knew how to handle remote locations. Um, we reached out to NPRDC and got our hands on as many reporter kits that we could get, mini disc. Um, I don't think, I don't think anybody used no, mini No, no, nobody, thank God nobody had to use mini um, But they had SD cards. Um, some of the panelists went out and got their own gear. They got uh, like Zoom recorders um, and USB microphones and things like that. And everybody recorded themselves um, remotely and we connected through Zoom and we recorded everybody's Zoom component as a backup so that we could use it if we needed to. Did you have any uh, bit rate issues with everybody doing their own thing? No. We could, we, we could convert them. Yeah, a lot of times it's something would show up at the wrong bit rate and we would just convert it. Yeah. We, we recorded 16-bit uh, 44.1 because it's back from when we used to have to archive stuff to CD, so we just never changed the format. Um. So what this, what this meant was that we would get everybody online starting at about 7, 
um, on a Thursday night from our homes. And we realized uh, within a couple of weeks that sometimes some of the recorders would quit um, mid-recording and we wouldn't catch it in time. So we got into the habit of after like every two games, I would, I would break in and, and say, look at your recorders, are they still rolling? You know, everybody would give me a verbal confirmation and we would do a countdown and we would continue. And at the end of the show, I would then instruct them all to upload the files. We would use Hightail um, as sort of our central uh, data gathering point. And they would upload all their files, which would take, you know, depending on who was doing what, it could take an hour, it could take two hours. I had one person leave and go to dinner. Um, and we Somebody would wait. Somebody else left to do a comedy set. Somebody in, in left Brooklyn. to do a comedy <laughs> set. <laughs> so so we would wait for these files to come in, and then I would create a multi track session, and I would sync everybody up. And I would break it down by, by game because our producers, um, they're, they're mostly writers. They're, they're not audio nerds. They can't handle a multi track session like that to edit. So I would mix it down. To, to two channel for them, two channel mono. And it let me fix any timing issues, you know, any level problems. I caught most of them. If I didn't catch them, I could get them the next day. Robert would pull all the phone audio, clean that up. And, and the guest audio. And the, the, and the, the guests usually job. joined us on by, uh, by, uh, by Zoom, and so it would just be the Zoom audio. Right. And Every once in a while, we would get a guest that would say, hey, I have a recorder here, would you like me to? Yes, we would. <laughs> and a lot of times, sometimes a guest would join us and I would say to our producer who sets this all up, they're sitting in a recording studio. Can they, but the problem is these guests have people who are dealing with our producers and sometimes the staff of, of the celebrity doesn't want to bother their client with saying, hey, can you record yourself? Usually they're fine to do it, but uh, their their representatives don't want to bother. So, yeah. but every once in a while somebody would say, "Would you like to record?" And and we had one guest that did that, uh, and this didn't show up when we were listening on Zoom during the recording. But he sent the recording in, and he had very loud air handling that kicked in about every five minutes. <laughs> so I would have to I, I cut it up I cut up the segment as you know the 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 audio that didn't have the air conditioning going and that did and I did different processing on each one and it I think it turned out pretty well and nobody knows except Lorna <laughs> <laughs> some of our um, panelists have been around a long time this is Roy and and he did have a switch 56 unit in his house mm, in right. the in the Berkshires or early on um, and he was able to do himself to record himself but uh, in these later years, he just he didn't have the wherewithal. So he uh, he has a house down in New Orleans where uh, Manoli Weatherall and Lars Howell from NPR um, retired to. So they had their own gear. So they set Roy up, and uh, God bless him, gave us some good audio for that show. Um, this guy came back. Uh, this is Tom Hanks again, and he came out and he just watched the whole show. Yeah, it was just he just <laughs> sat there watching the whole it's show. It's weird to be doing a show on Zoom and he's sitting there watching <laughs> the show. Watching us do it. Um, then finally, after 18 months, um, in August of 2022, we went back to the Man Center and did our first live show, and it was it was crazy how much. We felt out of place, how much we forgot, how much that stage crew had forgotten. Um, we, you know, we just weren't in our groove, and and that was something that I sorely missed. Um, it was great to be there. It was it was it was great to be to be working like this again. But it was not easy. It was hard. Um, we had real live people. We had real live people. Um, so during the COVID years, it was, it was made very clear by uh, Chase Bank 
um, that we weren't going to be coming back there to do shows. The people who had brought us in had retired, had left. Um, and the people who were there now didn't see any value. Um, and having us there, they didn't want the public coming into their building. Um, so. So they chased away one of the most popular radio shows in the country. Yeah, which yeah. was, which was, by this time it was okay. I blame Jamie Dimon personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was tough because in the, in the early days we had the same two guys working with us all the time. And towards the end it was just whatever, whatever guy they had up on the 55th floor could come down and he may not have ever worked with us before. So it was at this point becoming mutual. So this was move in day for Robert. Yeah. Um, the booth looks much neater now. That was the day we loaded in. <laughs> um, so the way this evolved was that there's one big large production booth um, and we have to share this booth with other productions that come in to do um, their plays, their puppet shows. There's all kinds of things that go on in there. So there's a, a garage door, that beige garage door um, that you see there that we can close and lock. And so all our stuff is on that side. And we don't have to worry about anybody getting in there and messing with our stuff and unplugging our stuff. Um, and they can use the rest of the booth. So it's on the third floor. So it's basically where that arrow is. Um, there's the public part and then there's the private part. We also have a fancy VIP area up there on the third floor where you can go and sit and have a cocktail and watch the show. And that's the most important part. We have bars. There's drinks. It makes the show so much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is what the stage looks like. We have to work in front of whatever set is there at the time. Sometimes there's a set, sometimes there's not. Um, so we either fly the banner or they'll fly a screen for us. And the nice thing about the large screen is not only do we have the logo on it, but if when we have a Zoom guest and they want to be on camera, they can be on camera. This happened a few so. times. Yeah, right now there's a show in there called Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. <laughs> and uh, so it looks like we're playing in front of a, 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 a set in the woods. <laughs> and that brings us to where we are today. This will be our sixth, sixth, sixth and time? seventh Yeah, something show. like that, yeah. We, I think we Hall. first went to Carnegie Hall in 2008 yeah. or 2009. Yeah. And that's that. Carnegie Hall has its challenges. Uh, anybody who's worked there, it's uh, it's it's a very live hall uh, designed for music. So that is, uh, we play better in theaters than in concert halls, just because of the resonance of the hall but we adapt and we count on the staff of the venue to make it sound right when, you know, in, in collaboration with us. Sometimes it works better than other times, but, but it's better than uh, the old churches and synagogues we used to have to play in the early days. Wow. Um, okay. The, I had a list of questions and I'm basically gonna throw them out here because uh, you basically covered everything, but what was the most interesting situation you guys have run into besides your Miami trip? Can we play that audio? <laughs> yeah, we can. I'm going to mess up the screen, so sorry. Uh, let's see. This is unrehearsed, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. Can I set this up, Lorna? Yes, you can. We did, uh, do you remember what year this was? 2019? 2018, 2019? 2017. 2017. We did uh, two shows at the Moore Theater in uh, Seattle, uh, which is a, was not our preferred venue, but the Paramount Theater was not available, so we did two shows at the Moore. It's kind of an old, rickety place. And uh, the Thursday night show went fine. On the Friday night show, everything checked out at the, before the show, but somehow when we tried to bring up the first phone caller, all the phone lines had gone out. And that's our, that's our show. So Lauren has a recording of what happened there. All right, this is, this is a last minute change, uh, but this is what we're gonna do. Normally, uh, we have people who call in to play our games, 
uh, from around the country. But apparently, just before the show began, all our phone lines failed. Oh. So we are going to do something that quite literally we have never done before. <gasps> we are going to invite one of you. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, cool. I'm sorry. No, you're not coming up, but we're gonna, you're gonna stay in your seat and we have one of our producers who's gonna work the crowd and find one of you. We have, I think, about four of you in the course of the show to play our games. Right. Wow. Wow. This, this, is, this is amazing. Like, so we had a producer go out into the crowd and, with a handheld mic and uh, pick somebody to play the games. It was, uh, it was a disaster. You know, we sort of uh, made lemonade out of those lemons. It, it was a really fun show for that audience. Um, another question? No, uh, you were about to say something. Um, one problem, well, one feature of Peter Sagal um, is that sometimes he, he talks a little fast. Um, he's always been a fast talker. Um, as a kid, and it gets him into trouble once in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so this happened at a show. Bowl? Right, bowl. Apparently, after the ancient Egyptians invented beer, they came up with an appropriate activity to pursue <laughs> while drinking it. <laughs> Bowling! <laughs> according to an Egyptologist at penis... Ex according to an Egyptologist... What? Did I say that? I'm sorry, I didn't say that. They, they, <laughs> they, they is, were I drinking a lot. I know. <laughs> All that Egyptian beer. Try that again. Is that a school? It is. According to an Egyptologist at Pisa University. Oh, okay. I know. We'll do this again. They also have a girls' school. Yeah. <laughs> we ain't never going to finish this now, Paula. Thanks a lot. I guess it's in Regina. Yeah, thank you. Everybody's getting in on the act. Dickinson University. We'll try this again. We'll try this again. And everybody, everybody be cool, because, you know. According to an Italian Egyptologist, quote, we first discovered a room with a very well-built limestone floor. Then we noticed a lane and two stone balls, unquote. <laughs> That's, that's, uh, that's actually like, written in my script, okay? Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is N.P.R. <laughs> so for those at home, uh, Peter uh, stumbled over Pisa University and accidentally said Penis University. <laughs> The caller picked up on it and mentioned the, uh, the Canadian city of Regina. Uh, <laughs> and the script actually mentioned a, a lane with two balls. So uh, uh, those things just happen organically sometimes. <laughs> one, one of the oddest things about us being a radio show is sometimes we have to arrange for um, American Sign Language interpreters for people who come to the show. So this is an example um, of what happened one night when we had two of those on stage with us. One of our favorite stories was, uh, for instance, President Reagan during his first term, he won a tough vote in the Congress to sell military planes to Saudi Arabia. And- um, That worked out great. It did. And <laughs> the reporters asked the aides, they said, what, what was Mr. Reagan's reaction to the vote? And the, rep and the aide said, well, Mr. Reagan said, thank God. What Reagan actually said once the vote went through, and this is President Reagan, he said, quote, I feel like I just crapped a pineapple, unquote. <laughs> that, that was my favorite bit of sign language all evening. I, know. I think I'd like to see that replayed. Yes, Peter. I just say that again, <laughs> crapped a pineapple. <laughs> Excellent. That was great. I don't know which way the pineapple's going, but it doesn't look good. No. <laughs> it, it, in fairness to that aid, if you actually did crap a pineapple, I, the very next thing you'd say 
It's <laughs> <laughs> a very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once that was over. Yeah. Coming up, it's lightning fill in the blank. But you first, were, you really thought that through. <laughs> Sadly, I that was like some actor studio stuff you were doing there. You really were thinking, crap a pineapple and then what? Yep. You're just saying it more so they have to do it more. I know you guys. <laughs> saying what? Crap a pineapple? <laughs> oh, that's not true at all. No. Peter, the reason that I said crap a pineapple is because... Yeah, if you'd said something like crap a coconut or crap a kiwi, <laughs> crap a live twitching <laughs> ferret, then maybe it would bear repeating. <laughs> Am I right? I, I think. <laughs> I think in the case of crap alive switching ferret, he's correct. <laughs> You get the gist. Yeah. <laughs> so it does go off the rails sometimes. It, Paula is notorious for taking it off the rails. We Did we didn't air it that show. Um, we do uh, what we call evergreen shows to run during the holidays, um, and we decided to put it in one of those shows, and received a call from NPR <laughs> lawyers saying that the FCC wanted us to know that if we ever ran it again, that every radio station would be fined. So while nothing particular was said, the, the feeling was there. So it's only aired once. Do you also have the video footage? No, we no, don't, we do don't video. take video. We don't take video. Yeah. How much footage you want to do? No. Well, Roey just jumped the, the, uh, us here because I was going to open up for questions. If anyone has any questions, please raise a hand or uh, post on Facebook and Roey will read it to us. Um, and I'm going to start off with uh, one question. What was the most interesting guest request you've had? In terms of what they needed? What they needed to do the show. Um... People have been pretty understanding um, that we're public radio. Like, for example, um, Tom Hanks just asked for, you know, whatever we would pay a normal guest host and, you know, whatever we would pay for a hotel for that person. And, you know, he, he took that money, but then he went and stayed at the Four Seasons. Um, you know, so he just took what we gave him. Um, one of the funny thing about tomorrow night is that our guest um, apparently requested hair and makeup, so we're doing hair and makeup tomorrow night for radio. For radio, where you're, she's going to wear headphones. Um, so, um, Dax Shepard wanted to, was going to be a panelist at one point, but he wanted first class tickets to fly, and we don't do that so, so yeah, we didn't so do that we've, so we've never heard Dax Shepard on the show <laughs> well as a guest but not as a panelist yeah, yeah. Um, no they're usually free and, and it goes the other way we had um, Leonard Nimoy I remember that one and he was in Chicago and he came before the show had dinner with us which was catered by Boston Market let me tell you he had never had Boston Market before and we introduced it to him, and he sat off stage with me, right here, for the whole show. I had Spock right here, <laughs> you know. So you know, our our experiences have gone, you know, the other way, not the unpleasant way for the most part, but from the very. Did surprised. he say uh, this is illogical or anything? No, <laughs> no. Yeah, it, it, oftentimes the guests are plugging something, you know, they've written a book or you know, just like on the late night TV shows. So. They don't make a whole lot of demands, uh, but then they they don't often volunteer a lot either. Uh, Lorna mentioned that we now have the capability of doing Zoom video 
for the shows in Chicago. And we've probably, since we introduced it, the first time was with Weird Al Yankovic about six months ago. And we've probably only had about half a dozen people take us up on it so far. Uh, we can allow them to see the, the cast on stage and not show them. And uh, I think we'll be doing more of that when people don't want to be, because a lot of these people, if they don't have to go through hair and makeup, they don't want to have to. You know, they, if it's just a radio show, they'll, they'd rather not be seen. Uh, but uh, sometimes they don't mind, because like Weird Al Yankovic, what difference does it make, really? <laughs> Has there been any guests that went totally uh, off uh, any expectation and uh, you couldn't use it or anything? Close. Close. We've always used something. We did have a guest uh, uh, who's in, uh, who I will not name, and I won't name the, uh, the band he is in. Um, I wouldn't want to give him that kind of chef's kiss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, he was he was pretty. Um, it ended up being about a two minute chat and a game, and we extended the rest of the segment because he was so offensive. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions, Roy? Okay, um, that's how thorough we are. But we do have a question from Steve Ward. Yeah, I just, um, I'm a big fan of the show, and I listen throughout the pandemic, and I'm, uh, kudos to you for keeping it going and keeping the formula going, and and it was really great. Uh, how do you generate the energy without the crowd there? Well, that's a good question, uh, because uh, <clears throat> Peter Sagal talks about this. They, they kind of, and he, he would discuss it with the panelists, they had to change uh, the amount of writing that they did because they, they would have to sort of uh, add more explanations, add more material, because there was an audience reaction. Uh, the panelists uh, supported each other. Everybody on the cast supported each other uh, by you know, laughing and contributing to what other people said. Uh, when we did go back to live shows, it was such a relief for them because they didn't have to do that as much. They could count on the, on the audience there. But uh, yeah, they did have to sort of change the way they approach the show, the way they approach the writing. Because one thing that we learned as we started to do live shows is that you have to allow the show to breathe. You, ha you can't cut those laughs too short. You can't cut, cut the applause too short. You've got to get it a, a natural feel to how this is going. So, yeah, to make up that time was, was something that they had to come up with in, in, the, in the COVID years. Um, if I can get back, since this is the AES, um, I'm gonna ask a technical question. When, you, when during the pandemic and they were all in their separate locations, obviously they were using different microphones than they would be on stage and so forth. What were you using? A combination of uh, whatever we had, uh, RE15s, RE50s, um, reporter mics for um, some of the staff. Some of them went out and bought, you know, Yetis, Snowballs, you know, whatever. And what was your um, experience in mixing all of all those uh, prosumer, consumer, and professional microphones and so forth? Um, it was, some of them were better than others. Um, we did a lot of, we did a lot of audio processing processing on those shows um, more than we would do, you know, on the way the show is today. Um, we tried to even things out. We we used a lot of deverb um, to kill uh, room reflections. Um, we rolled off a lot of things to make um, things sound a little less tubby or a little less bassy. Um, it was. It was a trick to make things sound similar, um, but we had to find the line where we were just making it sound different and not better. We got as, I, you know, we got as close as we could, but yeah. remember, a lot of people were using Zoom at that time. Yeah. So people were familiar with this, with different kinds of sounds during their conferences and during their business meetings. So it was something that, that, that people accepted even though we couldn't really 
get it to sound exactly the same. They were uh, accustomed to different, you know, room acoustics. But then you had to go back. Yes. And uh, d did you find that people's voices changed or, uh, or that y you had to rethink about how people should sound and so forth? No, because our the the NPR the NPR philosophy that was taught to me was you know keep it simple keep it natural um, grab the best performance that you can with what you've got um, and that's what we've always done and I think the performers adapted pretty quickly once yeah. they were once they were in front of an audience again they fell back into those uh, rhythms pretty well. Uh, it, it was a lot harder uh, adjusting to just uh, to doing the sort of the business of it again, f figuring out uh, you know how to relate to our crews again and you know what everybody's expectations was, v uh, relating to the venues again. Who like oh, how do we how do we do these contracts again? You know, <laughs> it was just a, a, a p people had been out of the practice for so long. Uh, that it was it was kind of a, a, a steep learning curve to get back into it. Okay. Two quick questions. Yes, you said right. D-verb. Is that with synaptic or isotope? What was your preferred D D reverb? Um, that was one I grabbed. I think it was Akon. Uh huh. Akon. Yeah. Uh, we also d used uh, a, a, a lot of a isotope. lot of isotope. Cool. A lot of noise reduction on isotope. Synaptic works really well too. Okay. Uh, unveil. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the recording, you did say you use DPA mics. Do you also you tend to mic the audience and, and uh, as a separate component, or you have enough of it already that you don't need to have that? We do. Um, the DPAs that, that I fall back on most of the time are the Omnis. Mm -hmm. So we pick up quite a bit of audience um, that way. We do have two Sennheiser um, 416s on stands that we shoot into the audience, but they're barely in the mix. They're barely in the, it just gives it a, just a touch of stereo imaging. Cool. Uh, but because the, the DPAs really pick up plenty of audience. Sure, noise. it's the Omni, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and also the, the 416, the little bit that we do have in, tends to help if, if somebody hits their cough switch in the middle of a big applause, it, you hear it, the applause dropping out, so. Mm -hmm. You mentioned And those are shotgun mics, right? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned stereo imaging. Um, are, are you now distributing the show in stereo? Oh, yeah. It's always been It's always stereo. been in stereo. Oh, okay. The music has always been in stereo, and the live shows, they're just panned slightly. Just, just a little. Just yeah. a little, just yeah. to open them up. Just to give it a little bit of an image. Okay. Um, yes, yeah. uh, please come to the microphone if you have a question. Hi. Uh, I had a question about the uh, CD chase venue or place that, that you guys first got. I was wondering how you guys financed that. Was that coming out of the program? Was that out of your own pocket? Or Because I, I, I believe you said that that was at the start. Right. That was free. That was it free? was very advantageous because <laughs> four times in an hour we said live from the Chase it's Bank Auditorium. Mm. And each one of those mentions has a value. So they, they gave it to us for free. That's a good deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, any uh, online? <coughs> Any questions online, Rowie? And and just to be clear, the Studebaker Theater is um, free as well. Uh, yes, and I'm sure they're selling lots of Studebakers. <laughs> <laughs> In spite of the name, it it it's 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 uh, it has. Um, there is a financial arrangement. It's it's oh. very good for us. I don't remember. I don't remember what it exactly is but the thing is we're sort of putting that theater on the map mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing a lot of clients in for them because they it was it was a pit before and they really couldn't do anything with it uh, the one stipulation is that wh whoever rents the theater uh, can't count on Thursday nights because that's when we do our show I just want to remind everyone uh, that tomorrow night uh, the AES in Philadelphia is highlighting another show, Fresh Air. Uh, Joyce Lieberman is putting that one together, and you can find the information in the loop to listen to that one. Um, I want to thank everybody here today, Steve Ward and the crew, and Sam, our audio guy, and 
uh, your uh, camera people here at Mercy University for this wonderful production. And I want to thank Steve Ward and uh, Roe Shamir from the AES for helping get this going. Uh, and Lorna White and Robert Newhouse, thank you very much. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the, the assistance of New York Public Radio in putting us all together to do this. And uh, thank you again. And this is the Audio Engineering Society. Thank you. Thank you.